So welcome everyone. I, I'm Alba and first I want to start thanking the organization for making this conference possible and also for giving me the opportunity to talk about part of my investigation, which is about reinterpreting domestic and maintaining activities in the urban culture, but focusing on the limitation practices and its impact in building the gender identity. Before getting into the research itself, I believe it's important to talk a bit about the theoretical framework because it has been the main reason to boost this type of studies. As for sure we all know, it has been three major feminist movements. All of them have carried out important changes in our society. But the third wave feminism has been the most transcendent in our discipline. It incorporates the concept and the consideration of gender, first in anthropology and then in archaeology around the early 90s. So the concept of maintenance activities is created in order to make visible the woman experience and all the activities and dynamics carried out by and around them. It was developed as a revenue component. If we check the anthropolog anthropological and ethnographic record, most part of these labors were actually performed by women. The key here is to understand that they, were, they haven't been properly studied because they were thought as women activities and due to that subordinated because of our actual patriarchal system. But these activities are not other than the everyday life tasks and the most basic and necessary to keep the function of the society. These are the alimentation practices, the care and socialization of children, the textile industry, the care of people in the society in general, and the practice of relationship, which is what later we called a relational identity, and the practice of mobility. So I'm going to focus on the alimentation sphere to prove the amount of social information that we as archaeologists can obtain from them. We have to have clear that there's two complementary levels of significance when we talk about alimentation. First, in terms of survival, which is the need to eat in order to function. And then in terms of culture. It refers not only to turning raw materials into nutritious food, but also into socially edible products. The group it refers to the group ability to choose something to eat and the way it's going to be eaten. Uh, the limitation is fears uh, and practices are such a routine act. And due to that, they have had uh, less social questioning about them. So I think the right way of approaching the limitation practices is to understand them as a circle, that is to say, as an operating chain in which different members of the society are needed in order to work. The conceptualization of tasks being carried out by a strict gender dichotomy is not accurate in the Iberian culture. By believing the contrary, we tend to limit the real impact of an activity only by our actual mindset, which is, again, heavily influenced by the gender binary. So traditionally, the the alimentation has been studied as a result, summarized in the act of eating. This is highly affected by the classical occidental uh, cultures, Greece and Rome, in which eating has an imaginary of performance, of classism and masculine sense. So traditional archaeology has fomented this gender asymmetry in terms of labor and benefit, because all the work carried out necessary in order to eat as can be pottery production or raw material processing, have been kind of silent as it has been understood as feminine. So with that, you give more importance and more attention to the final act, which is exceptional. Um, so it's not the goal that I'm trying to pursue here. And also, uh, it doesn't happen in every single class of the society. So we have left a non-daily life picture imported from other cultures, highly patriarchal cultures, that it's not the actual information or even perception from the Iberian culture of the alimentation practices. In the interest of getting as much as the acrony studies I called, my research is focusing on three archaeological sites of the central area of Contestania, which is in the east of Spain, nearby to Alicante. 
These are el cabezo de Mariola, la serreta, and el puch de Alcoy. These all three have a common historical becoming. So with the overlap of the archaeological record, it has been possible to run an approach from the sixth century till the first one before our common era. The archaeological materiality that I've taken into account has been the paleobiological record, seeds and fauna, and ceramic containers, taking into account the planimetry. The first ones have contributed to prove that this group's alimentation basis follow the main scheme of the Iberian agricultural groups of what is called País Valenciano, in the east of Spain again. But the pottery has given singular information. We are going to analyze uh, them in terms of shape and size. So, shape. Um, uh, we can see on the screen that during four centuries, there has been a monotony of pots, which tell us that the main culinary technique was boiling. Uh, also in the late 5th and 4th century, the lay is incorporated. So the pottery production, um, to the pottery production, sorry. But the pots are still made by hand. So we cannot perceive the domestic control of them. Around the 2nd and the 1st century, we detect a new shape, the casserole or pen. Um, so a new technique is at roasting, grilling. The changes in the cooking uh, containers require a change in the uh, serving and consuming containers. But not only that, first, we are going to have more formal variety of them, and second, more containers assigned to the drinking sphere, as we can see on the slide. Uh, more important is to realize that different types of culinary techniques imply different ways of human interaction with food. And also, the time used to cook is going to change. So there will be less or more freedom to develop other activities due to the method, cooking method that it's being used. That is to say, the possibility of multitasking. So um, the alimentation, as we are starting to see, it's not only a physiological need. They have cultural implication. They build culture. But they have seen as a passive reflection of what was going on in a society, which is true, but they also work as an active agent. Its execution or possible variation implies a reset of the rest of the tasks and therefore of the daily life. This is what Bourdieu calls habitus. So an example that perfectly illustrates how changes in food practices can trigger or even support sociocultural changes is um, studied by the, archaeologic, the archaeologist uh, Sandra Monton when she was uh, studying in a group in Senegal. She explains the consequences of the uh, impossibility to access to the couscous that was traditionally made there. So um, this was replaced by one that was kind of cheaper and required more time to um, do and also more um, work and time. So they didn't have the time to develop other activities that they were actually um, doing. So this caused many women to abandon their um, conjugal houses and go back to their family homes, causing a total readjustment in communal social relationships. Now we go to the size. This aspect has been applied into the pots only because they are the most recurrent and large record over time in this society and taking into account the domestic speciality of the three archaeological sites that I previously named. Thanks to a volumetric study, we've obtained the capacity of the pots. With that, they have been divided into two categories, small and big. On the one hand, the small ones have a capacity around one and a half, two and a half liters. On the other hand, based on the planimetry that is in the slide, we've detected what is called monofocal houses, which are the ones with two, one or two departments and complex monofocal houses with, with two or more departments. So this domestic uh, structure matches with what with the called nuclear families or conjugal of two generations, consisting of four or five people. So if we divide the capacity of the pots 
into these four or five people, we've obtained a food portion around 2,000, uh, 4,000 milliliters per person. We know that this is an average portion of food in this type of society, thanks to classical sources and comparative and anthropological studies that I don't have really the time to properly dig in. Um, therefore, both the domestic structures and the food supply capacity of the pots coincide. Now we go to the big pots. With a capacity around three and a half, five liters, we run the same method. Based on the planimetry, we have detected these monofocal houses and complex monofocal houses, but with variation in the residential form. That is to say, areas with communal use. If we maintain the food portion that I previously say, said, these pots can supply around 11, 15 people, with matches with the called extended household or supra-family aggregates. These are social groups larger than the nuclear families already named. Both variants of information match again. In addition, uh, one of these communal areas in El Puig has a ritual burial with one infant, with three adult sheep and one fetus. So with that, we see that they are trying to award to this type of spaces with symbolical meaning. Therefore, here we have a practical case of how, through archaeological materiality, we can obtain information on how these groups were organized. A proper theoretical and methodological framework makes us avoid and not project strict dichotomies as what is domestic, what is not domestic, because we are already seeing that the alimentation spheres goes beyond this domestic unit. Um, also, what is woman activities and what is men activities, which is so actual. Um, this goes beyond the domestic sphere as it is organizing human relationships and makes possible carried out holistic research in which is proved that both the domestic unit and the extended one have importance in the daily life of these groups and actually were needed to develop the operating chain of the alimentation practices. I understand this chain uh, made by three steps. The first one is securing raw materials and the production of storage, processing, and service equipment. Second, the culinary techniques and food processing, which I talked about, and the food service and consumption patterns. It also changes the mainstream narrative about the Iberian culture that considers more important the domestic unit above the suprafamily aggregates. We have already seen that um, thanks to the alimentation practices, we see that these types of unit have different importance in the daily life of these societies. With all of that being said, we have to briefly testify to process because of their importance in the identity building process, especially the gender identity. First, we have seen the importance of the alimentation practices and therefore the maintenance activities in human relations, which is society. So if we accept that most of that work is carried out by women, a big part of the culture is in their hands. Having to accept that uh, that part of the social matrix, the habitus, transfers through matrilineal basis. We are talking about a type of knowledge that needs to be taught and learned through generations and with the presence of the body. This brings us to the last slide. The role of the body hasn't been considered in the study of many of the social dynamics because since the enlightenment happened, the mind became idealized and the importance of the body was the night. We all know the famous cogito ergo sum or homo sapiens sapiens. But in no modern society, which is the case of the Iberian culture, there is not that level of separation between mind and body. The setting of most of the identities uh, happens through the body with clothing, grave goods, and jewelry and so on. The key here is that both maintenance activities and the so-called relational identity, which is, well, 
the author of this um, explanation is Almudena Hernando. It's the one executed to link internally the group and it's exercised mainly by women. This both um, happens through the body. So this also explains uh, why activities like the whole alimentation practices uh, hasn't received enough information. First, because they were understood made only by women. And second, because they need and go through the body. This is exactly the embodiment. It's the role that the human body plays uh, in cognitive and social processes and how it is culturally understood. So the act of eating is one of the practices that requires the, mo the body the most. So here we have food, which is material culture, that is consumed by a culturally constructed body in a socially conceived act. So um, not paying attention to them, it's, <laughs> it doesn't have any sense. And just to sum up, uh, one of the alimentation practices that can be most understand as embodiment is breastfeeding. This one has received even less attention because besides to its connection to the maintenance activities, it is linked to the motherhood and childhood, which are the great forgotten. Both are cultural process that must be studied in each society and not just be assumed due to the recurrence for being a biological event and a vital stage. And that will be it. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>